I want to take you back about 33 years ago to 1987. Our daughter Laura was only two years old and Dave and I had been married just 12 years. It's hard to even remember back that far. It was June, June the 12th, and former President Ronald Reagan spoke in front of the Brandenburg Gate at the Berlin Wall. In his speech, he made a challenge to Mikhail Gorbachev, leader of the then Soviet Union. The best known words from that speech are these. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, liberalization come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 29 months later, Mikhail Gorbachev did just that. He allowed Berliners to destroy the wall. It wasn't long after that momentous act that the Soviet Union collapsed. Something there is, said poet Robert Frost, that doesn't like a wall, that wants it down. Pastor Jerry Locke tells about a time when he was asked to stay with a man's family at the hospital while he went, underwent cancer surgery. The gentleman named Tom had raised three girls, but then was divorced. Later, he married Betty. Betty loved Tom and was a good wife to him. Tom's three grown daughters had refused to recognize Betty as their father's wife for many, many years. That day, when Pastor Locke entered the hospital room, the spirit of bitterness and tension was so real, you could cut it with a knife. The pastor greeted everyone, and then Tom asked him to pray. Locke prayed a prayer that day that he had never prayed before and probably has not prayed since. In his prayer, he said, Dear Lord, you know the need that Tom has as he faces this surgery for his cancer. But Lord, before we ask you to do anything for Tom physically, I pray that you will deal with the cancer of bitterness that has destroyed this family for years. By that time, Tom, or Mr. Locke, was watching and praying, wishing he could just inch his way back to the door to the hallway. When he closed his prayer and looked up, everyone in the room was crying, and those three daughters moved across the room and for the very first time hugged Betty and asked for forgiveness. Be careful when you build a wall. Walls can destroy as well as protect. You know, we know all about walls right now. Over the past few years here in the United States, all kinds of walls have been erected. Walls between people of different color, different social and economic climes, different states, different political parties, different genders, different religious thoughts. The list goes on and on. Right now, it feels as though we are a nation of walls. Each brick of those walls shows some sort of lack of communication, lack of a willingness to talk and discuss the differences that we have, an unwillingness to work towards peace. Paul knew all about walls. In our lesson today from Ephesians, he writes that Christ has broken down the walls of hostility. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What Paul was referring to here was the wall that stood in the temple of Jerusalem. It was about four foot high and ran through the court of the temple. The purpose of the wall was to keep the Gentiles, you and me, from entering the inner court into which only the Jews were permitted to go. In fact, there was a sign there that warned anyone who wasn't a Jew that entering this area was punishable by death. Paul calls this wall a wall of hostility. If you think about it, Paul was really writing about two walls in this verse. 
The first was the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. The second one was the wall that separates all of mankind, including you and me, from God. His words in Ephesians are not easy for us to relate to, but listen closely to the rest of this passage. Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility to each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were once far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. That's the most important teaching of this passage, I think. Christ came to reconcile, to reunite us with each other and to God. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, after the coming of Christ into the world, and the world is still filled with so much hate and so much animosity. The year was 1944. Bert Friesen was an infantryman on the front lines in Europe. American forces had advanced in the face of intermittent shelling and small arms fire throughout the morning hours. But now, all was quiet. Bert's patrol reached the edge of a wooded area with an open field before them. Unbeknownst to the Americans, a battery of Germans were ready and waiting in a hedgerow about 200 yards across the field. Bert was one of two scouts who moved out into the clearing. Once he was halfway across the field, the remainder of his battalion followed. Suddenly, the Germans opened fire, and machine gun fire ripped through both of Bert's legs. The American battalion withdrew into the woods for protection, while a rapid exchange of fire continued. Bert lay helplessly in a small stream as shots volleyed overhead from one side to the other. There seemed to be no way out of his dilemma. To make matters worse, he now noticed that there was a German soldier crawling towards him. Death appeared imminent. He closed his eyes and waited. To his surprise, a considerable period of time passed without the expected attack. So he ventured open one eye, and he was startled to see that the German was kneeling at his side smiling. He then noticed that the shooting had totally stopped. Troops from both sides of the battlefield watched anxiously. Without any verbal exchange, this mysterious German reached down to lift Bert into his strong arms and proceeded to carry him to the safety of his own comrades. Having accomplished his self-appointed mission and still without speaking a word, the German soldier turned and walked back across the field to the Nazi line. No one dared break the silence of the moment. Though the ceasefire ended just a few moments later, there wasn't one present on the battlefield that day who hadn't witnessed love break out. Why is it we hate so much? Why is it that we kill? There are still many veterans in our land who bear scars from the Vietnam War not just physical scars, but emotional scars as well. They served their country honorably, but they came back to a nation that was once again divided by walls. There was no hero's welcome for many of them. Instead, they were jeered at and scorned. All the negative attention and animosity only compounded the, doubt, the doubts that they already had about their role in the war. William Willimon an American theologian and bishop in the United Methodist Church, now retired, told of hearing a man, a U.S. pilot in Vietnam, tell of his experience in that horrible conflict. He told of bearing down on a Vietnamese village to drop his bombs. As he pushed through the clouds, he caught the glimpse of a church. The man said it must have been Sunday because I could see a crowd of people entering the church in the village. It was only a glimpse, but I could see clearly. They were Christians. Nobody ever told me that Vietnam was a Christian country. It could have been my hometown, my Catholic church. They looked just like me. They worshiped the same way we worship. Nobody told me. 
Those are tough memories to deal with, to carry with you throughout the rest of your life. Many of our veterans still carry many hurts. That's why the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, is so important, so comforting. Christ came to bring peace. Christ came to reconcile us to one another. He came to reconcile us to God. The truth is we all need saving and Christ is the only one who can do it. Christ is the glue that holds us all together. I have one more story to share. A number of years ago, when I was a youth director at another church, we did a winter retreat that focused almost entirely on a message by Louis Giglio, an exciting Christian speaker and evangelist that focused on something called laminin. L-A-M-I-N-I-N. Laminins are of a family of proteins that are integral in the structural scaffolding of basement membranes in almost every animal tissue. Did you get that? Well, in plain language, laminins are what hold us all together. They are cell adhesion molecules. They are what hold one cell of our bodies to the next cell. Without them, we would literally fall apart. In his talk, and I have it on DVD, or you can see it on YouTube, Louis Giglio talks about how inconceivably big our God is, how he spoke the universe into being, how he breathed stars out of his mouth. Then he goes on to speak of how the star-breathing, universe-creating God also knit together our human bodies with amazing detail and wonder. He goes on to remind us that we can trust that the God who created all of this also has the power to hold it all together when things seem to be falling apart. How our loving creator is also the stainer, sustainer through rough times. Then he tells us about laminin, these cell adhesion molecules that hold us all together. Do you know what's even more amazing about laminin other than it's at the center of every cell? It's what it looks like. Can you see it? The glue that holds us together, all of us, appears in the shape of a cross. It's a powerful image of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Through the cross, he holds us all together. Tear down your wall, whatever your wall is. The wall that separates you from those around you, and more importantly, the wall that separates you from God. Christ has come into the world to reunite us one with the other, and to reunite us with the God who created us. Open your heart this day to the one who truly holds it all together, and be at peace. Amen and amen.